Now, since we're here celebrating Tova's birthday, the first question I wanted to ask you is how birthdays were celebrated in the Janssen family. Are there any sort of particular traditions or special memories that you have from childhood? Well, because it's still summertime, um, Tova would have been on the island for most of her birthdays. And uh, the tradition was that um, you know, all the family and close friends would get into their boats and uh, drive out to the island and then you'd have a party, a birthday party. Uh, and of course, uh, for some strange reason, the weather was always nice. <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess uh, Sorbe had sort of put in a, you know, a, a wish uh, for nice weather. But it was it was a very nice day always. My memories are very sort of warm and and lovely from her birthdays. That's nice. I've got um, also some questions from fans here for you today, and there's a very important one that I think we need to address very early on, which is what kind of birthday cake did Tova like best? <laughs> okay, um, I think as um, her friends and family came from the archipelago where you normally live with quite sort of Spartan circumstances. Um, there weren't any really cakes from the shop. People would have, uh, have brought something they made themselves. So as it's blueberry season, blueberry pie was a standard. And then um, in the sort of circle of friends you had the Gustavsons where the Janssons used to live at first when they came out in the archipelago and Greta, mother Greta made this amazing cake uh, that we called, well I have to say it in Swedish, Vridubulla, but it's uh, it's also goes by an another name, Boston cake and it was this sort of a uh, sweet coffee bread, but rolled into these round buns, and then they were put together into this beautiful flour, and that was a real delicacy. So that would have been on the list as well, I think. That sounds delicious. We'll all have to look up recipes for that afterwards. It sounds amazing. Definitely. <laughs> Now, another fan question um, that was submitted in advance that I thought was very interesting was, why do you think celebrating things is so important in the Moomin books? It feels like one of those things that have gone from Tova's life into her work. And I'd love to know what you think about that. Well, I think it's sort of a, a, an old truth that if you work very, very hard, which Tova did actually all her life, uh, you need sort of a release from that and then parties became that and uh, I think it started with especially her father who was uh, the, the great sculptor and he he liked to have a party or two uh, when he wasn't working and so uh, I think she saw that and um, and how much fun it was to dance and play instruments and drink a little bit and, and you know, just basically be with friends and have a sort of really just a time when you weren't thinking about everyday life, which was to a point uh, pretty much always, it meant a lot of work or, or you know, other sort of harder circumstances. So I think parties were, you know, that's when friends loosen up and you get to talk and meet. And and I think for Tove it was very important. And not only for Tove, I think it's important for everybody. I think everybody should have parties all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good life lesson I think we can take from her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned that Tova would have spent lots of her birthdays on the island of Klov Harun, where she spent most of her summers. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about the island and sort of paint a picture for those of us who haven't been there or perhaps people who kind of weren't aware of the way that she spent her summers. Well, for those who have never been on an island, it's... Uh... Either you sort of, you, you love it or you hate it. But I think in, in Finland, uh, a lot of people live around the coast and they have this 
very, very close relationship to being in boats on islands uh, or by a lake uh, and just taking, you know, the time to to be somewhere else than, than in the city where you're normally working or normally living. And and Klovharan is an island in the very, very outer archipelago. And so it had no trees and it was basically a barren rock with this, this well, still is, uh, with this little lagoon in the middle. Mm -hmm. Where I mean, probably fans have seen pictures of Torba when she's swimming in the lagoon, even yeah. with, the, you know, her birthday wreath on mm -hmm. her head. And uh, there was no electricity, no running water. Uh, so it, it was a bit like camping, but for Torva it was paradise uh, because also it was far away. So she was left in peace. I mean, she had uh, um, the time to to work, maybe on things that she wouldn't work on normally, and um, and she and her partner Torti could could be there, you know, um, on their own, of course you know, with friends and family close by who came to visit, so they weren't sort of left there. But it was it was still, for them, a retreat. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, going back to basics type of yep. thing. And, uh, but I mean, it's important to remember that Tuve was working incessantly. So she worked when she was on the island too. And she mm -hmm. went or the two of them moved out there really early in May and came back late September. So that would have been almost five months of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that's only possible to do because they were, or, or was possible to do because they were artists. Yes. But um, I mean, they absolutely, I mean, they thought of nothing else, you know, after Christmas about the time when they could start packing their little boxes and, write neatly on top what was inside them <laughs> or when they would move out to the island. It's so wonderful. It's just, I love to imagine them there having that time and being so creative and sort of inspired by the landscape and by one another. And um, I've actually been thinking about it a lot recently, partly because of the fact that we've all been living in lockdown for months. And I was thinking, do you know what? I think Tova and Tuti would have been very good at this because actually... They spent months every summer living in that kind of small area that we've been sort of restricted to. And they seem to have excelled at entertaining themselves and one another. So I wondered if you thought they might have any advice for us about how to live in that way and kind of, you know, make the most of those experiences. Well, I mean, it, that, 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 it is an interesting question, I think, because I think people sometimes feel that when they're confined in a small space, that, uh, you know, that's limiting. But in mm -hmm. fact, of course, it can be the complete opposite, mm -hmm. because it can give you the peace and quiet to just start imagining these worlds and using your imagination and the smallest little, you know, object or sort of uh, relationship or happening can in fact be whole entire world if you let it if you start mm -hmm. you know imagining creating the story around it yeah. and and so I mean Tuve and Tuti yeah I mean when they were on the island it's amazing to think what they did for example for those lucky ones who have seen those amazing sets from Tuve's Mumim books in 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 the Moomin Museum the the tableaus mm -hmm. I mean they built all of those out on the island they in fact played and I think that's the key thing uh, mm -hmm. people get to play I think you should play uh, and you can play anywhere I mean you can play on your own or you know with and build things or recite yeah. things or I mean I don't know talk to an imaginary somebody or <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it might sound crazy, but I, I I do think that people are often in such a hurry that they really don't tap into their imagination, and yeah. that's that's what Tuva and Tuti knew how to do. 
Mm -hmm. They always, they were always basically playing in their minds. And then, of course, because they were so good at making things, they actually made uh, actual things that we can now see and, and read and enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's so true that often as adults, we stop playing um, and it's something that children should never stop doing and I'm sure is a, is a part of how they were able to be so creative and also create work that appealed to children and adults alike because they were sort of effectively being both at the same time, even in their, in their own lives. Um, I think it's, yeah, it, it, it's something that we all need to remember to do more of. Yeah, um, I mean, I think they were extremely good at sort of uh, not necessarily denying the, the the hard hardships in life, but also seeing the other side and trying. You know, I've said this before, but sort of laugh in the face of adversity somehow, but but with a very kind and sort of uh, I don't know uh, humanistic approach to 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 what life is about that you know, basically we should be nice and kind to each other and and do fun things. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, before we move off the topic of summers, Uncle of Harun, you mentioned Tova's flower crown, which so many of us are familiar with from those beautiful photos. And I think you have it with you there so we can see it. Yeah. <laughs> what a treat to be able to see that and to have that with you today. It's yeah. so iconic. I think we so, you know, that, that photograph of her swimming in the sea wearing the flower crown um, just captures so much of her spirit. Thank you for showing us. Yeah. There's a, the, I, actually, we probably haven't got time, but I should tell you that this is the original one. There are, there's, there's another one. <laughs> a uh, replica. Uh, because they made then two of them, but this is the original one that then would sort of travel in the archipelago from one birthday to the next. <laughs> so actually this one, uh, because I'd conveniently forgotten the other one, I have borrowed from its present home now, but it is wow. the original one. So is it still in use? Does it still come out on birthdays or is it now kind of more treasured and, and, and kept just for special occasions like this? Uh, I think uh, I think they have it for special occasions because nobody in the family, as far as I know, has uh, a birthday in August. Or, uh, mm -hmm. but but I do think, yeah, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's loved, it's greatly loved, and Torba yeah. herself donated it to that family, so it's oh, definitely yeah. very much part of her legacy that she's, yeah. you know, wanted this this very cherished object to to have a a, a future life. Mm -hmm. To live on. Wonderful. Now, today is a is an extra special day because in addition to it being Tova's birthday, it's the first official flag day for her in Finland. And I wondered if you could explain for those of us outside of Finland what that means. Well, I mean, we raise the flag to important people uh, on different days of the year in Finland. Uh, and... For various other reasons and and um it was this was an initiative actually that came from the interior ministry and they said uh you know we propose that we we try out to have this day when we raise the flag nationally in the whole country for Tuva Jansson and Finland's all you know art and culture Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, it's an amazing honor and a wonderful initiative. But it doesn't mean that it will live on in the future unless people actually raise the flag. So it's also a challenge to everybody out there: do raise your flags <laughs> on the ninth of August, uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise, you know. It we won't become a flag day for for Finnish culture and art and Tuve Jansson. So uh, so I really urge everybody to wave their flags, whatever little flag they have, uh, so that we can make sure that this uh, lives on. Um, 
And and I think Tuve also had little Moomin flags and all sorts of things <laughs> way back when. So so it's you know taken the right way. It's 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 a very very nice gesture. Good. Well, I mean. Uh, oh, and I forgot. Can I say, Caitlin, one of course. more important thing? Um, she's only the second woman to be awarded this honor. I mean, we have lots of male, famous male uh, figures mm -hmm. that have had, um, you know, this this honor or got this honor. But I mean, she's only the second woman. So I think all you women out there. You know, it's important that we very, get very important. There are lots of fantastic women artists of all kinds that deserve to be flagged, and and so, yee ho! Let's let's flag for a for Tuve <laughs> today and make it happen for other women as well. Wonderful, it's. It it's so, um, you know, her legacy is, is so impressive and so far reaching. And you know, just later today, I'll be talking to Alma, who plays Tova in the upcoming film, to Nat, who is involved in publishing Tova's work and ensuring more people are reading it, and to Kia Henry, who was the Snook Maiden in the new animation. So there are still so many creative people today who are being inspired and are taking part in kind of retelling her stories or telling the story of her life. Um, and I wondered what you think it is about Tova's work that does continue to inspire creative people today? Um, well, I think Tova was quite exceptional as an artist because she worked sort of across genres. I mean, both mm -hmm in illustration, text, uh, sort of textual expression, mm -hmm. painting, and so on. Uh, but not only that, of course, it's it's what her art and what she was about. Uh, I think um, she touches people on a personal mm -hmm. level, but at the same time, what she says is extremely universal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a lot of her fans, when they when they take part of her work, they feel that somehow it touches them. But in fact, of course, what she is very much about is about general truths about how we should all treat each other and be. And she doesn't shy away from difficult themes, mm -hmm. which um, I think is is one of her, her sort of most endearing qualities that she actually deals with with stuff that is quite uh, usually difficult to deal with. I mean, say for example, loneliness. It's mm -hmm. uh, and 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 to be unhappy, but she doesn't sort of do it in a in a silly isolated context. I mean, she puts it into a bigger context where. The, the, the final basically message is that, you know, there is always another side to, yeah. to all those things. Also to happiness and to light, there's darkness. But but mm -hmm. if you have, you know, a tragedy, there's, there's something good on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think she just touches people very yeah. much. And that's why... You know, those people who work, especially maybe in the arts, who really have to sort of delve into emotion and expression and on a, usually based on sort of rather deep philosophy, uh, rather deeply philosoph philosophical ground, mm -hmm. they, they see what Tuve was doing and, and, and they, they get inspired by it. Mm -hmm. It's really the, the full range of emotions, I think, are, are available to you through the books. Um, so it's no wonder that people connect with them. I think whatever you're feeling in that particular moment when you read a moment story, you kind of connect with some sentiment um, in the books. I must ask you some more fan questions now. Okay. Um, so we've had a question. Now I know you, you find it very difficult to tell us your favorite character, so we won't ask you that. But people are curious to know whether you have a favorite moment book. 
can we press you to that point or is that also just <laughs> impossible for you? Um, I, I think it, it, it varies. Uh, slightly depending on year and mood but at mm -hmm. the moment I think uh, Moom and Papa and the Sea is definitely mm -hmm. one that that sort of comes back to me and I think it's because I'm in the archipelago and uh, I see those islands and those uh, markers and lighthouses and things and it just you know there's something about that book that is so I don't know so much what I what I what I love about this place. Uh, so so that that of the Moomin books, mm -hmm. I think that's the one I would pick now. Mm -hmm. um, then of course there's the summer book, yeah. uh, which is not a Moomin book, but uh, it's also set on an island, and for very obvious reasons, it's <laughs> it's definitely one of my favorites too. <laughs> Yes, I think unsurprising. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a beautiful, it's, you know, it, 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 the most beautiful book, but if it's also a kind of a family history and it kind of documents, you know, your personal relationships, and uh, of course, that's not a surprise to us. Um, beautiful. And someone else has asked us, what did you learn from Tova growing up so close to her? Is there anything that you sort of you think any life lessons in particular that you remember from her? Oh, it's very difficult to single out any one thing. I think uh, I think basically I, everything I know I learned from her and and the family and uh, but in, in terms of you know I think it's more about learning an attitude. Mm hmm. And I think it's um, it's not one single thing, but um, I think uh, it's it, it's about not having terrible preconceptions about what might come tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, about you know, kind of keeping your mind and your eyes and your ears open. Uh, and letting things come to you and not necessarily judging them before you know how exactly it's going to affect you. I think that's that's one thing that uh, Tove knew how to do. And, uh, and I think that's, that's one thing I'm very thankful for that I sort of inherited. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I feel like we've all we've all taken so much wisdom from this already. We've got lots of life lessons to go ahead with. I wanted to ask you now um, about the Our Sea campaign. So this campaign was launched to coincide with the 75th anniversary um, of the Moomins. And the campaign is to raise money to help clean up the Baltic Sea. And I would love to hear a bit more about what inspired the campaign and where the idea came from in the first place. Well, I think uh, I think we 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 knew that um, 2020 would be 75 years from when the first Moomin book was published, and we definitely knew we wanted to celebrate it somehow. And so a couple of years ago, um, in fact, the managing director of Moomin Characters was approached by a, a foundation that does a lot of work uh, for the Baltic Sea uh, about a corporation. And he said, why don't we make this our main theme for our 75th anniversary celebration? And uh, it happened to be a summer when the sea was in a really bad state in the middle of the summer. Right. It's, the Baltic Sea is a very small sea. It's very shallow and it suffers from greatly from too many nutrients, which sort of really eutrophicate the sea, which means it there's just lots of stuff growing in it. And among those things, are blue green algae and they are poisonous uh, to small children and dogs which means that in some areas of the baltic you know small people and small sm the small ones of us couldn't go swimming and that 
thought to me was just horrific because Torbe lived by the sea, like uh, we've discussed, on an island, and she loved to swim and jump in the sea. And, you know, the thought of not being able to is just really horrid. Mm -hmm. So it was a very good fit. And we thought, hey, we want to, you know, focus the celebrations uh, this year on trying to collect funds for this fantastic foundation, the Jon Norminen Foundation, that actually does very hands-on work to clean up the Baltic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, it's not a problem that's just in the Baltic. It's actually in other oceans worldwide. So all the projects that they then develop will be piloted in other countries, places as well. Mm -hmm. and see if it can help with, with cleaning up oceans elsewhere as well. Um, and because the sea was Torva's, you know, real sort of love. Yeah. Uh, and everything she did had something to do with the sea. So it's just, you know, it's really a no brainer mm -hmm. uh, to do it. And I mean, later on, you will talk to Alma and I think she can tell you that she spent some time by the sea. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it's not just us, it's, it's yeah. it's much wider it's most people and of course those who spend their times that or their summer holidays by a lake they feel equally attached to the water um, yeah. but then it's in a different kind of you know scope but they need to be kept clean too the lakes mm -hmm. so it's um you know i think it's quite close to everybody's heart in the nordic countries and yeah. all the countries around the baltic in fact Mm -hmm. And and people can support the campaign through purchasing a range of different products where proceeds will go towards it. I've got my OSC necklace on yeah. here. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are all sorts of beautiful, beautiful things. And um, I think nearly 500,000 euros have been raised already, which is really incredible. So we'd encourage people very much to support the campaign. I've got two quick questions now for you. I know we've got two minutes left, but I'm going to try to squeeze two more in. So we're all starting to get really, really excited about the upcoming film about Tova's life. And I wanted to know how much you've been involved in the film. Have you sort of been advising or have you kind of stepped away from the production and let the creative team work their magic on it? How involved have you been? Well, I'm happy to say that the team that made the film and all the actors and everybody are and were amazing during, you know, the whole shoot of the film and everything. So I could have stepped away completely and not been part of it because, you know, they would have uh, made it all work uh, completely without us. But we were very lucky. We were actually involved. We had a very nice sort of corporation and I think it was based on mutual trust and, and a general sort of nice atmosphere. Uh, and so we, we got to read the scripts and actually go on set and, <laughs> and see all the props and meet the actors. And it was, it was really fun. Uh, I think for, for those of us who, you know, haven't really had that much to do with, with film, it was really exciting. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we were we were definitely involved, but in the best possible way, I think. Excellent. Well, I'll be speaking to Alma next, so I'll be finding out a lot more about it then. But I have to ask you one final thing, which I'm putting to all of our guests today. The question: What would you give Tova as a birthday present today? Uh, that, that, that's a difficult one. Um, I could say all of the, you know, her favorite things like shells, stones, um, mm -hmm. a bouquet of wildflowers, uh, and so on. But I think really, uh, the older she became, the the thing she wanted the most was peace and quiet. <laughs> so, so you just leave her alone for the day. <laughs> so basically, uh, I would try and and, and I suppose uh, give her that. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sophia. It's been lovely talking to you. And um, I'm sure everyone has really, really enjoyed having that insight. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. <laughs> have a lovely rest of, you know, your streaming session. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sophia. Take care. Thank you. Bye. So I'm going to introduce our next guest now, um, Helsinki-born actress Alma Posti who graduated in 2007 from the Theatre Academy at the University of Helsinki and has since featured in a range of productions for film, TV and theatre. She's acted on most of the big stages in both Finland and Sweden, frequently does voice work with animations and audiobooks. And we're talking to her today because she has her first starring role in a feature film, playing Tove Janssen. Welcome, Alma. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> so the film Tova, it focuses on the years from the mid 1940s to the mid 1950s because there are a number of very interesting things happening in Tova's life then both sort of in a professional capacity and a personal capacity so I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about why those years were chosen and why they were so formative for Tova. Well, you could really call them her formative years in a, in a way. Uh, it starts out during the war and this is something that affected Tove deeply. And she, mm -hmm. uh, she also made caricatures and she, uh, about the, the situation in the world for the, the magazine Garm, which was, mm -hmm. a, which was a political magazine. And she, she took her stance, which was a very brave thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, she also... She was uh, creating the whole world of, of the movies and also then pu published her first works. Yeah. And uh, well, there's so much that happened during these times. It was very intense, I think. She was mm -hmm. deeply in love with Otto Spiritanen, who was a, a politician and a philosopher at the time, who you can also say was the was a figure for Snufkin. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then she fell in love with a woman, Vivica Bandler, and uh, who was a theater director, and this really rocked her world, I think, in many ways. So there's just like a carousel of things going on, and what she needs to somehow uh, take in and discover, and and then also becoming an independent artist. <laughs> She was working hard on being a painter, being taken seriously as a woman in this very male mm -hmm. world. And yeah. also, like you talked with Sophia about that she came from this artist family with a, with a sculpture father who, who had a strong impact. But she, she needed to, to become independent, I think, during this time as well. Yes, to establish herself in her own right. Yeah. yeah, it's so. I think it's a, it's such a crucial period. I mean, her whole life is fascinating. So it must have been quite difficult to to narrow it down. But I think an understanding of that period does help um, throw light on on all of her work. Um, excellent. She she always Toby Anson always seems to me to be such a unique person, and I think. That's partly because she was really a woman of many contradictions. So as we were talking about earlier, she loved a party and, you know, she was in a way quite a wild character and very bold, but at the same time, liked to have her quiet time away from other people, um, kind of retiring a bit from the spotlight. Do you think those contradictions are important to her character? I think so. And it's vast. The, the way she worked and her attitude to, uh, towards her work was both playful, but also very serious. And uh, mm -hmm. she also took her audience serious, seriously. The children, for example, never, uh, never treating them as children or being cute about it. She, she raises difficult topics, as, as you talked about before. And, uh, but then she always finds the joy and the sparks in it and the, the, contradicts, the contradictions. So you have a comet, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you have to have uh, like a small party somewhere. You can't, you can't <laughs> let the doom of the world sort of yeah. determine your existence. 
Mm -hmm. so, so, but there are big themes and big questions she's she's dealing with. She always mm -hmm. said I think that it's that you have to make children's books. Um, it's a crime not to have trust in them, and you really can't you can't kill the the, <laughs> the creature that the kids are are. Uh, <laughs> like loving the most that's that's something no no that's a no no but maybe you can yeah. do something small or something that there's many of <laughs> <laughs> something like, like this yeah. never the main character and uh and also <laughs> that you have to really make the circumstances hard uh and the struggle real for for the story to yeah. work and mm -hmm. at the time she that was well they were very pedagogical, the stories for children and, and the yes. theater plays and, and so on. So they had to always have a lesson. In, mm -hmm. And I think Tove didn't care about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are many um, things that you can take from her stories that inspire you to live a certain way or look at the world in a certain way. But it's clearly not her objective in writing them to teach people. It's kind of the story comes first, um, but because the, the values are so strong, um, there are things that you can take from them without it being the, the purpose to teach you, um, which, as you say, was very unusual at the time in particular. And very mm -hmm. what somehow. <laughs> so so Alma being finished yourself you will have grown up with the Moomins they will have been a part of your life for forever um, but how did you go about actually preparing to play Tova it's one thing to know about the Moomins but another thing to take on this role well it's it's a very humbling task when to get to be asked to play somebody like Tove Jansson uh, who lived on this planet not long ago and you have to, to be very respectful and in the same way as she was brave kind of meet her in in a brave way and not to be too too polite or put her on a pedestal because mm -hmm. I think he would have liked that either so it's it's mm -hmm. it's been a journey to find some kind of honesty in, in what we're doing and that the mm -hmm to show and what circumstances she had to meet or live with uh, at that time. So in a more complete, uh, concrete way, I was spending a lot of time at art exhibitions where you can see her work. And I, I was reading there and just kind of taking in the atmosphere. And I, I did this role now twice. And when I was preparing for, for Tove on the theater stage at the Swedish theater in Helsinki, I, I lived in Stockholm before, and fortunately there was this huge art exhibition, a retrospective with Tove's art. And there was all, all the painting, all the sketches, all the drawings, all the, you could see the whole process. So you see one, the, the finished picture, but you see all the journey that it takes to get yeah. or to her and what, how much work she did. It's, it's really amazing. It's like she lived many lives during one lifetime yeah. and had many yeah. careers. So this was something to take in. And also for me, maybe more as an adult, watching her as an adult and not a, a child anymore. So getting to know her, her adult work or mm -hmm. short sto stories and novels and also how great of a painter she really was. This was something yeah. I discovered and I was really yeah. inspired by and taken by. I think we can see a, a photo now actually of you as Tova from the film. So it's a, a still from the movie when you are painting in the studio. And I think the atmosphere of this is so magical. Yeah. Um, I imagine you you visited to the studio in the in sort of preparation for the role and were able to soak up some of that. Um, we're so excited to see it. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> and I can't wait. You could say that you're you're destined to play this part because, as you mentioned, you you played over in the theater before um, in another production, but you also come from a family that's 
you know, in, very involved in the theatre and the world of film. And I believe that your grandmother knew Tova as well. So could you tell us a, a bit about that family connection? Well, actually, both of my grandparents, my grandmother and my, my grandfather on my father's side, were good friends with Tove, and uh, they played. Actually, my grandmother was in the play, the first world premiere of a Tove Jansson play in Svenska Teatern. Mm -hmm. uh, she played the aunt of the Hemulen. <laughs> and, uh, my grandfather was the first moving troll. Uh, or Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they had this professional connection, but but they also became very good friends, and uh, they were so during their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So Did they were calling always... and writing letters, and uh, you know, hanging out. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Did you ever have an opportunity to meet Tova yourself when you were little? Well, yes, actually, uh, she and Tuti. Tuliki Pietele came to, to my family's house one time for dinner. and uh, But I was very small at that time, maybe. So no memories? Well, yes, I do remember that they came and it was super exciting. And then Tuliki was playing with us. We were always playing with my brother. And then they, bought, uh, they brought with them these tiny little figures that they uh, had made. And wow. they were treasures until our, our, our dog ate them at <laughs> once. I mean, he he was a villain of that story. <laughs> he was a huge bloodhound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I imagine that took a while to forgive. Yeah, <laughs> but he was so cute. You couldn't stay mad for long. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's you, we've touched on the fact that it, it's it's a really big role to take on. You know, Toby Anson, she's such an important figure in Finnish cultural history and, and created one of the country's biggest exports. So were you nervous about taking the role on? Yes, actually, yeah, to be honest, I, I was. Because, as I mentioned before, you really want to respect her and, and at the same time kind of go under her skin. So this mm -hmm. is, with a biopic, I think the, the difficult task to find your way to do it. But um, I don't know, there were so many good conversations with, for example, with Sofia that kind of gave me the inspiration to, to sort of take it on and uh, yeah. f feel free to do an interpretation because this is what mm -hmm. it is, not a documentary. Yeah. We're playing around with this wonderful yeah. character, Ove Jansson, and, uh, and telling this story. It's a, it's a interesting situation to be in when you're telling the story of someone's life. But as you say, it's not a documentary. You have to pick and choose which stories, which elements, which events to include, which relationships. So as you say, you can't hold yourself to being, um, you want to be truthful, but at the same time, you're aware that you're presenting a, a portion of a life rather than the whole thing. That's an interesting, interesting balance to strike. Yes, very much mm -hmm. so. And I also <laughs> think that Saida Barirut, who uh, directed the movie, she was very good at this, had like a straight course mm -hmm. and uh, kind of kept, kept us grounded. Yeah, wonderful. And it can be quite a long process making a film. So it can be quite a long time from doing your first audition to the film actually coming out but it is soon to premiere in Finland in October so how are you feeling are you excited what um, emotions are you having <laughs> I'm so excited finally and yeah yeah it's a curious to see how how people will find it and if they will find something to do that they perhaps didn't know from before and uh, yeah it's going to be interesting to see now when our yeah. little bubble becomes bigger and meets <laughs> in the world. <laughs> yeah. Some of the fans have been asking because they, they've been submitting their comments, their questions in advance and also on, on Facebook now as we're live. Um, and they're curious to hear about what you think people will learn from the film. 
maybe because it is a time journey of sorts. So it's mm -hmm. a lot of circumstances. And, and about how much the war affected her for one thing, but also I think the whole attitude in, in this love, uh, how would you say it? Well, carousel of love. Yeah. <laughs> um, the bravery and curiosity that she's not living by the norms. She, she also says that I'm not falling in love with gender, I'm falling in love with a person. And mm -hmm. that's such a beautiful way to put it. But you also have to remember that at that time in Finland, homosexuality, for example, was illegal or considered a sickness or so yeah. it was a whole different time than we live now. And maybe it's good mm -hmm. to be reminded of, of that. And also maybe like mm -hmm. how, like the, the picture we saw, there are two ways painting over her, her painting with white. Yes. Like the self-critique that also was going on and this inner process and struggle, the inner dialogue that's going on inside an artist, being mm -hmm. of all, all of these things. And, and there she's painting more abstract and she's finding it hard. And also because when you see her final works, everything seems easy and it's, it's a perfect. Yes. But when you see maybe the movie, you can see the journey before the per perfection was there and uh, mm -hmm. also the flaws maybe and that's that's interesting absolutely yes so real um real insights into the the woman behind the art that we're all so familiar with brilliant um alma do you have a favorite scene from the film or a favorite memory from the production perhaps well <laughs> I remember one of the last days in the studio by the barrier with our director was shouting, remember, cuteness is our enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and this I will never forget because it was such a brilliant way to put it. Because Tove can sometimes lean towards this cuteness because, but she's so much more than that. So that was yeah. one thing that keeps, keeps ringing in my head. Uh, <laughs> Another time was, <laughs> that was also one of the last days of filming was uh, because because of climate change, there was no snow in Finland this winter. And uh, the scene, which was named titled uh, Two Way Skiing, couldn't be made. <laughs> so we changed yep. it into Two Way Swimming. <laughs> and it was <laughs> February. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> but... So that's that's an experience I, I'll I'll never forget either because I'm I'm not a huge fan of cold water myself, but I know that Tuva <laughs> loves loved uh, swimming. She was a great yeah. swimmer. So if Tuva needed to swim, she needed to swim. So, yeah. so that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those cases where you have to to suffer for your art. <laughs> um, I think some some of the Fans at home are struggling a little with your, um, the video is a little bit um, glitchy because, but it's because Alma, you're at your beautiful summer cottage, aren't you? We can see some gorgeous Finnish summer behind us. I feel like you're really bringing it into our homes. <laughs> it's like the Moomin Valley a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> um, we've had some more really, really fantastic questions in from fans. Uh, so someone is asking, has acting in the movie affected your life philosophy in some way? Which I think is a brilliant question. I think being a reminded of the bravery she possessed, I, I try to cherish that as much as I can and kind of staying open mm -hmm. to people and uh, yeah. in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And being serious about what you do, but never take yourself too serious. That's uh, yeah. That's a fine line. That's a, that's a really good one. If only we could all master it, <laughs> then I think our lives would be much improved. <laughs> um, another question about your sort of your history with the Moomins and your relationship with them. Um, Stephanie is asking, what is your first memory of the Moomins? I think I already knew the book 
uh, the book about Moomin, Mimbaland, Little Mai, you know, the right, red mm -hmm. one, the whole thing. Yeah. It's yeah. probably chewing on that one. It <laughs> 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 would be my first memory of, of them. Uh, and I, I know I knew that book by heart when I was very little already. And yeah. Yeah, I think, I think something like little me biting things. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking a lot with that. <laughs> you could really relate to that as a, as a child. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, um, as we talked about with Sophia earlier, today is the first official flag day for Tova, which is a, a really significant recognition uh, of her work and her contribution to Finnish art and culture. What do you think her, her legacy is? What do you think is sort of, you know, why is she still so important to us? I think there are many, many reasons for this. Uh, one might be that she saw the invisible small people and she sort of mm -hmm. brought them attention and told their story. And uh, I think a lot of people can relate to being invisible somehow. If it's the Nini mm -hmm. from the Visible Child or Tofu yeah. being shy. And then the values she carries are really, she's like a pacifistic superhero. That, that's the kind of world she mm -hmm. creates and the, the stories that she carries. And uh, we, we desperately need those stories still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there, there is that. <laughs> Also, mm -hmm. that, quite a big thing <laughs> that you can um, that she's creating these, these threats that you can relate to your own I don't know whatever is going on in your life and how to deal with things she's she's giving you suggestions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alma a number of people are asking on social media whether you feel like you have any kind of characteristics or personality traits in common with Tova that have helped you to play her? I could never really answer that myself. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's I think, in the, the viewer's eye. I, I try to find mm -hmm. my inner Tove and I'd be true to, to her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you now this, this, this big question that we're asking to everybody today, but I have, I have warned you all, I've prepared everyone. We would love to know what you would give Tova as a birthday present today. Well, I actually went and picked some flowers. <laughs> oh. Here they are. These are the <laughs> ones. Can you see them? Beautiful. They grow yeah. a lot in the south of Finland. It's called wild pansy, I think, in English. And uh, they grow out on the islands as well. So this would be some kind of a reminder. <laughs> a little. I'm sure she would love them. <laughs> <laughs> and that fits very much with Sophia, what was saying about how, you know, Tova at, at when she was sort of later in her life, just wanted some peace and quiet so you could just take her the flowers and leave her for the day to enjoy them yes 